String theory says we may be living in a universe where reality meets science fiction. A universe of 11 dimensions with parallel universes right next door. An elegant universe composed entirely of the music of strings. But for all its ambition, the basic idea of string theory is surprisingly simple. It says that everything in the universe, from the tiniest particle to the most distant star, is made from one kind of ingredient, unimaginably small, vibrating strands of energy called strings. Just as the strings of a cello can give rise to a rich variety of musical notes. The tiny strings in string theory vibrate in a multitude of different ways, making up all the constituents of nature. In other words, the universe is like a grand cosmic symphony resonating with all the various notes these tiny vibrating strands of energy can play. 2,000 years ago, there were a group of Greek philosophers called the Pythagoreans. And they worked out the laws of harmony on a violin string. They realized if you take a violin string and you looked at the resonance of it, the resonances corresponded to integers, and they were marveled that music could be explained in terms of a vibrating string. This is a sine wave. A sine wave is the basic building block of sound. Any sound could be constructed by combining several sine waves in different frequencies. Let's look at the sign in our frequency analyzer. As you can see, the sign only has one peak and has no frequency content on any side of the spectrum. This is why a sine wave is often referred as a pure tone, as it is the only sound that consists of a single basic frequency. This basic frequency is called the fundamental frequency. Harmonic overtones will always be the fundamental frequency multiplied by a whole number. Let's take for example the note A, 110 Hz. It has a fundamental frequency of 110 Hz, and its first harmonic is its fundamental frequency, 110 Hz. Its second harmonic would be the frequency times 2, which means 220 hertz. The third one will be 330 hertz times 4, times 5, and so on. The, the idea behind the system is to keep our wave cycle repetitive, and the only way to do that is to have the overtones start and finish at the same phase of the fundamental frequency. As you can see here, we have a green, blue, we have small sine waves here that represent the harmonics of the sound. The first harmonic would be the fundamental frequency. The second harmonic has two cycles per one cycle of the fundamental frequency, and because of that it starts and it ends at the same point. And it's the same with the third harmonic, which has three cycles per one, or here we have four cycles per one, and you can actually follow it, it's pretty accurate. And so on, to infinity. Let's listen to those harmonics. Does it sound musically familiar? Of course it does. This is the building block of all music. It occurs naturally in nature and it exists in all human music. Let's look at the relations between frequencies. I have selected 220 Hz as my fundamental frequency and my next overtone will be an octave higher, the fr fundamental frequency times 2. That's 440 Hz. The next overtone will be 
a fifth higher than the second overtone, or an octave and a fifth higher than the fundamental. The fourth one will be two octaves higher than the fundamental, and a perfect fourth higher than the previous overtone. And they then said that perhaps the universe could be explained by the laws of harmony. We now believe that we can revive the thoughts of the early Pythagoreans and explain the universe through vibrating superstrings. Some people say, you know, Professor, when I see a chair, I know what a chair is, I can feel a chair, touch a chair. But you physicists, when you talk about strings, what the hell is that? Well, yes, we are all agreed what a chair is. The chair has four legs, and it's made out of wood or metal, and it has atoms inside. However, what makes up the atoms? Well, if you look inside the atoms, there's electrons whizzing around the nucleus. Well, what are they made out of? You can smash them apart. Inside the nucleus, there are uh, protons and neutrons. Well, we've smashed them. What's inside neutrons and protons? Well, we think there's something called quarks. Well, does it stop there? Does it stop at the quarks? The objective of particle physics is to understand the basic structure and laws in nature. All the way from the largest dimension in the universe, formation of galaxies and stars, all the way down to the smallest dimension in the microcosm. So historically we knew about all of the different elements in nature. We knew about helium, hydrogen, oxygen, gold, lead and so on, which are all made of different atoms. But a great simplification was made when we realized that all the atoms are just made out of three particles, the protons, the neutrons and the electrons. And just by adding more protons, more electrons, we get a different element, a different type of atom. In principle, you can build a very simple universe with just protons, neutrons, and electrons. But it became much more complicated in the beginning of the 20th century when we found many, many new particles from cosmic rays. There wasn't really a system established to organize this zoo of particles. So we were calling these new particles things like pi, sigma, delta, and so on. And things got so bad, we were running out of symbols to name these particles. So we started organizing these particles according to the properties they have. And the properties are things like spin, electrical charge, so if they're positively charged, negatively charged, or neutral, mass of the particles, and the lifetime of the particles, which is how long it takes before they decay into lighter particles. To simplify the picture, new fundamental particles called quarks were predicted. And the whole zoo of particles could be described by combinations of these quarks. And this was the birth of the standard model. At the beginning, there were only three quarks. Then a fourth, fifth, and sixth quarks was predicted and then discovered, and this gave us great confidence in the model. In addition to these quarks, there's another set of fundamental building blocks of matter, the so-called leptons. They are composed of an electron, their heavier cousins, the muon and the tau, and their neutrino partners. In addition to the fundamental building blocks of matter, the standard model also incorporates the fundamental forces. The exchange particles of the weak force are the W and the Z boson. 
A weak force explains the energy production in the sun and is responsible for the radioactive beta decay. The electromagnetic force acts on charged particles. The corresponding force carrier is the photon. The electromagnetic force is responsible for propagation of light or for the fact that a magnet can pick up a paperclip. The strong interaction acts on the quarks. The corresponding force carrier is the gluon. The gluon literally glues together the quarks in the neutrons and the protons and it holds the nucleus together. The standard model is extremely successful and it has predicted all the phenomena we have seen so far at the microscopic level. For decades, physicists believed that the tiniest bits inside an atom were point particles. Flying around the outside were the electrons, and inside were protons and neutrons, which were made up of quarks. But string theory says that what we thought were indivisible particles are actually tiny vibrating strings. It is nothing really mystical. It's a really tiny string. It either closes into its little circle or it has endpoints, but it's just a little string. In the 1980s, the idea caught on and people started jumping on the string bandwagon. One of the great attractions of strings is their versatility. Just as the strings on a cello can vibrate at different frequencies, making all the individual musical notes, in the same way, the tiny strings of string theory vibrate and dance in different patterns, creating all the fundamental particles of nature. We now believe that if you had a microscope and could look at the quarks themselves, you would realize that they are nothing but little loops little tiny vibrating loops vibrating at a certain mode and if you whacked it hard enough it would turn into an electron and if you whacked it hard enough again it would turn into light so in other words we're talking about an elemental uber form of matter one object such that if it simply vibrates in a different way it can create all the things we see around us therefore instead of having this whole zoo of subatomic particles you just have the string. However, this theory had a very big defect. A defect so great that it led to the near death of this theory. This theory predicts that the universe exists in 10-dimensional hyperspace. And I remember the very instant that was worked out in the early 70s. At that point, the cynics said, this is Star Trek. Beam me up, Scotty. I mean, you want us to believe that there are hidden dimensions out there? Just like the mystics used to talk about ghosts and demons in higher dimensional space? We were laughed at. It was very hard for us physicists to get jobs. People were saying, this is science fiction. This is not physics. We're talking about a theory of everything based on 10-dimensional hyperspace? Come on. Well, we have the last laugh. Because now, string theory is taught in all the major universities. All the Ivy League schools are scrambling to hire string theorists. And we now believe that the mind of God, the mind of God is music resonating through 10-dimensional hyperspace. If this view is right, we get the grand and beautiful symphony that is our universe. What's really exciting about this is that it offers an amazing possibility. If we could only master the rhythms of strings, then we'd stand a good chance of explaining all the matter and all the forces of nature, from the tiniest subatomic particles to the galaxies of outer space. This is the potential of string theory to be a unified theory of everything.